Good morning, everybody. Do we have any football fans in the house? Then I don't have to tell you what today is. If you are a true football fan, you're going to be busy this afternoon. Do we have any God fans in the house today? Then once again, I don't have to tell you what today is. This is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And I don't think I'm by myself this morning. Come on, stand to your feet as we sing God Bless America.
see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, in your presence, all our fears are washed away. Washed away. Find strength to face the day. Thank you, Jesus. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. Washed away.
Welcome to Super Sunday, right? Amen. We got another reason to call it Super Sunday. You know, one of the things that, uh, that we have here at the Freedom Center, is that it? Yeah, Freedom Center. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> we have super teachers, right? Amen. One of them is uh, Dr. Dave and his class on uh, 845, right? It's on the uh, Millennium kingdom. Uh, something like that, all right? 845 every Sunday morning next door. You want some really fine teaching. Plus, next Sunday, R.T. Kendall will be right here. Look at this. We're coordinating. Every time I say something, it magically appears on the screen here. Unbelievable, the technology here. So, don't miss R.T. Kendall next Sunday morning here. Also, uh, Aaron, would you come on up? How many of y'all have youth ages 12 to 18? How many of y'all? Well, we have this awesome youth camp coming up. It's going to be in July, the week after July 4th. It's an awesome time. It's YFN. This is my alma mater. It's the school where, I, well, Practically, the camps are going to be at the school where I went to. CF and I, Christ for the Nations. It's an awesome time. And I have a video I'd like to show you. It kind of gives a, a short synopsis of what the whole camp is about. We need some audio. And people who aren't satisfied with the status quo. We believe that in order to accomplish great things, we need God more than money. And that the right amount of focus, sweat, paint fumes, prayer, and servanthood is a recipe for success. We are not the best camp on the planet. 
We're the best camp we can be every single time. is designed through a year of prayer to make Jesus the access point of the entire camp experience. We believe in excellence. We give God our best. After all, we live to make His name famous. YFN is a camp. It would be easy to limit to that one simple perspective. However, that would be a lie. We are more than a camp and more than a youth conference. YFN is a movement. This movement channels a growing flood of teenagers sweeping through the world with a fresh sense of purpose and divine inspiration. Yes, we believe in young people. They aren't just the leaders of tomorrow, but they are the influencers of today. One of our biggest aspects is our interns who love to serve and to serve this generation. To serve the YFN vision, because nobody is perishing on our watch. We are a perfectly combined symmetry of youth camp and youth leaders fused together. Art, music, and technology are constantly changing, and so are we. The only thing predictable about our camp is the presence of God. And now it's your turn to respond. Join us. This is YFN. This is an awesome camp. If you talk to anyone who has been to YFN, they'll say it was a life-changing experience for them. Your kids will not want to miss this. So we're taking applications. If you guys have any questions, come talk to me. Our applications are in the back right there. So God bless. All right. It's like some fun times. Also, next Sunday, we're going to be starting uh, Growing Kids God's Way. It's uh, up, yeah, up here uh, at the church at 5 o'clock. This is led by uh, Brian and Cassandra Teal. So, if you're interested in that, that's the next Sunday. Also coming up, all right, February 15th. You guys uh, kind of aware of the 14th, uh, whatever. It is Valentine's Day, so we're going to have right here, the Sweetheart Banquet, all right, Fe Friday, February 15th, but make sure you sign up in the back. We, we have some sweethearts we know are coming that haven't signed up yet, okay? So the little sweethearts need to have uh, food, so we need you to sign up in the back, all right? And there's going to be uh, extra prizes and surprises, so that's uh, Friday the, the 15th. Uh, it's going to be up here at 630 CT, would you come on up, please? Good morning, everyone. I want you to know that I love you, and Jesus loves you, too. Uh, I need some help. Who's willing to help me? <laughs> okay. Uh, I need help at the nursing home ministry. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, the Bible says go into all the world and preach the gospel. Amen? So, you know, our elders, they need us. They need the word of God. And that's what we do. We don't go serve cookies. We don't do that. We go and feed them with the word. Okay? So, 
And there's a lot of elder people need Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Everybody need him, but there's a lot of elder people that got money and they don't have Jesus. Okay? So it's our responsibility as Christians to make sure that we feed them. Amen? Spiritually. And if you need any directions, please, or whatever you need, meet me back there after church service, okay? And I'll talk to you in just a few minutes, and I'll give you direction. Thank you so much. God bless. It's a neat outreach of, uh, of our church here. Also, Pastor Clarence is starting a, a outreach called Love Our Neighbors. Love Our Neighbors. Uh -huh. That's going to be Saturday, February 16th, up here at 10 o'clock. So uh, this is going to be an outreach to the neighborhood, obviously. So also, if you are a first or second time visitor to the Freedom Center here, we'd love to have you stand and stay standing. We've got uh, all kinds of, ah, there you go. First or second time visitor, please stand up. There we go. And uh, make sure that you fill out that, uh, that card that's in there, too. We've, uh, sometimes we get visitors that don't stand, and they're kind of missing some surprises. I understand there's some neat things in that bag, so amen? Thank you. Thank you. Also, one last thing. Remember last week we had some, uh, uh, a couple, Bob and Lee Harrell from China, that came over. Used, Bob used to be, uh, and Lee used to be elders here. And they're in China this week, continuing the trend of having somebody internationally. We have Dr. Sai and his wife, Tina, all the way from Taiwan. Amen. Praise the Lord. I miss them. We're going to have water baptism this morning. Praise God. Let's give Jesus a hand. Amen. We have Elijah Benoit that's going to be baptized by his daddy this morning. Praise the Lord. Elijah, have you asked Jesus to be Lord of your Savior and forgive you of your sins? Yes, sir. Well, in the name of the Father and the Son, I baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise the Lord. There's no place I'd rather I 
I'd rather be
21 days, I mean zero, then you probably weren't desperate for food at the end of that 21 days. Have you ever been desperate for something? I mean really desperate. That you would stop at nothing to achieve that goal. Brother Tracy used to run. And I bet there were times, brother, that you were desperate for the finish line. It might have only been halfway through the race. It might have been seven-eighths through the race. It didn't matter where you were. What matters is your level of desperation. Do we really mean, Lord, I'm desperate for you? Or are we just mouthing the words to a song? Can we really set aside and put aside anything that the Bible says would easily beset us? And run the race without hindrance, without a thought of anything else in our minds that might slow us down. Truly desperate. Ah. I'm desperate for you. And I for you. 
I'm desperate for you, for you, Lord, for you, and I. I'm lost without you. I'm desperate for you. I'm desperate for you. I'm lost without you. I'm desperate for you. You ever uh, go into an encyclopedia and looked up church? Anybody ever done that? I'm kind of weird that way. Sometimes I just pick a word, look it up. <laughs> and it's real interesting. If you look up the word church, go get a Britannica encyclopedia. Look it up. For the first paragraph, it's going to talk about you. It's going to talk about people. You know why? Because for 300 years, they didn't have a building. <laughs> until it was institutionalized and then it dedicates pages talking about architecture talking about buildings and it's interesting you know, the way the the change of the church through the centuries if you I've only been to overseas to really one huge cathedral and that was uh, uh, Notre Dame and uh, went to the catacombs underneath and saw the the original site of where it existed and and then you go through the history it took them centuries to build that structure as you see it determination and all that went into it and now we we meet in 10 buildings you know uh, not much to talk about this building because it's about the people it's about the people the church is about the people it's about a relationship with God. Everything in which we do, it's not about doctrine. It's not about theology. It's about Jesus <laughs> and who he came for, which is you. That's why we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We're family. That's why I don't worry about a building over there. I don't worry about this building. My wife is on the road right now. If I get a phone call from DPS and they tell me that my wife's been in an accident, I'm not going to ask, how's my car? Right. I'm going to ask, how's my wife? How is my bride? How's she doing? This is it right here. Today is going to be a little different too, than, and it'll be different than last Sunday. We won't have the same Sunday we had last Sunday. There's a different... just. It's a different day. Um, if you've ever been sailing, you don't catch the same wind every day. Yeah. You just put the sail up, f flow with what's there. I'm a, I'm a fisherman. Every morning I walk out the door, I look at my American flag to see which direction the, waves, the, the wind's coming from and how much it's blowing and think, oh, it'd be a good day to fish today. I could use my top water lures today. You know, it's a different wind and a different day. God loves you. God loves his body. And uh, I think there's some neat things we're going to talk about this morning. We had a sweet time of worship. Desperate for you. Falling in love with Jesus. I don't know about you, but I couldn't figure out how to do this walk until I really figured out it was about love. I tried to keep the rules. I've tried it all. Tried the schemes. Tried the newest thing. Read the latest book. And still failed. Still flawed until one day I figured out, you know what? I'm just going to worry about loving you. <laughs> out of all the love and grace that you're loving me with. No different than my own children. If I nurture a relationship with my children, and I don't care what parenting skills you got, but if you nurture in a relationship of love with your children, your children are going to succeed. They will. They're going to find something that will haunt them for the rest of their life. It's called love. So, Lord, we thank you for love. 
We thank you, Lord, that you first loved us. We wouldn't even have a clue, Lord God, about love, but that you first loved us. And, Lord, that you put your spirit inside of us and you have nurtured a relationship with us. And, Lord, in spite of our religion and our tendency, Father, to be concerned with ourselves and rather than others, and sometimes, Father, just too hard-headed to even listen to what your spirit trying to tell us, Lord God, you still are graciously loving us and we thank you lord god your grace and your mercy endures forever lord it is a it is a weapon to take into battle that your mercy and your grace endures forever it can bring confusion on the enemy they don't even know how to respond to it because your grace and your mercy endures forever and how you love your church how you love your people and we thank you lord god this day lord let you just be a sweet spirit in this place as we move forward in Jesus' name, amen. 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 You may be seated. Good morning, Freedom Center. It's time to take up our tithes and offerings this morning. Uh, the ushers have envelopes for those of you giving cash offerings. Uh, please raise your hand and... Uh, they will get uh, an envelope to you. Also, for, for those of you who may not be aware, uh, the ushers also carry around prayer request cards. And anything you would like the church and the church leadership to pray about or pray for you, please uh, uh, get a, obtain a card from one of the ushers and fill it out and uh, drop it in the collection bucket each, each Sunday. Uh, the, all the prayer requests are gathered each week and, and circulated uh, amongst the leadership for prayer. So... Uh, uh, we are here to, to pray for you, so, uh, so reach out to the ushers if you need a prayer request card. Uh, this morning, I want to share with you the, uh, a little bit of the story of Balaam, his donkey, and, and the angel out of Numbers uh, 22. I'm going to read uh, from verse 23 a couple of uh, verses here. Uh, when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing <clears throat> in the way with uh, his drawn sword in his hand, the donkey turned away and went into the field. But Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back into the way. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow pathway of the vineyard with a wall on one side and on the other side. When the donkey saw the, the angel of the Lord, she pressed herself against the wall and pressed Balaam's foot against the wall, so he struck her again. The angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was uh, no way to turn from, to the right or to the left. When the donkey uh, saw the angel of the Lord, she laid down under Balaam. So Balaam, uh, with anger, struck the donkey with a stick. And the Lord opened the donkey's mouth and said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? Then Balaam said to the donkey, Because you have made a mockery of me, if there had been a sword in my hand, I would have killed you by now. Then the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey on what you have uh, ridden all your life to this day. Uh, have I never <clears throat> been accustomed to do this to you? And, and Balaam said, no. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way <clears throat> with his drawn sword in his hand, and he bowed all the way down to the ground. <clears throat> now, Balaam, if you're familiar with the story, uh, Balaam is basically a prophet for hire. He heard from God. He obeyed God most of the time, but his heart was not God. His, his heart was in it for the money. Uh, King Balaam, uh, Balak had, uh, uh, had called uh, to Balaam and, uh, and wanted to hire him to curse the, uh, the Israelites. But God had told him, no, don't go do this. But Balaam argued with him. He wanted to go because he wanted the money. So God told him, okay, if they ask you again, uh, mount your donkey and go. Well, he was not asked again, but he went anyway. So God put these roadblocks uh, in his life. And the lesson here for us is when we have roadblocks in our life, we have to be careful to make sure that they're not roadblocks that, that are fulfilling our desires and our wills when actually God may be uh, there trying to prevent us to do something that he knows not, is not good for us. So when it comes to our finances or relationships or anything in authority that, that you uh, are walking in, make sure that those roadblocks that you're trying to knock down and are, aren't placed there by God, and don't get angry with them also. Amen? Amen? All right. Let's pray this morning. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just ask for, for you to, to examine our heart, Lord, so that we can serve you and fulfill your will. Uh, cut out the, the heart of Balaam from us, Lord, 
oh Lord, so that we can uh, walk in all you have. I ask you to bless these resources, these tithes and offerings this morning for your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
horse and the rider are thrown into the sea. The horse and the rider were thrown into the sea. trust in horses and chariots I will trust in the Lord my God I will trust in the Lord my God some may trust in horses and chariots but I will trust in the Lord my God
You might be wondering, why does he show that again? Well, first of all, I didn't get to see it, so <laughs> I couldn't look at anything but the carpet without busting into tears. But, um, you know, Sunday was an incredible day. I'll, uh, I'll never forget it. Never. And there were, I got in my uh, truck and turned to my wife and I said, <laughs> there were layers of things that were taking place in our body that it, it was just, I'm saturated. It was too much to process and, and had to go, you know, honestly, even that night and watch the whole thing again and, and soak things in. And the Lord began to share some things with me and I, and I, I started with that because I wanted to put some things in context for us. Today, today will be a little different. It's not really a sermon. It's more of a family discussion that we're having today. But um, somewhere we got to get to as a body that I believe. Um, first of all, what you need to know about that dance that you do not know, that even my daughter did not know, but I knew. And there's two things that I didn't play the part that she shared, but if, I'll just try to tell you there were two things that she was speaking out of. One was um, growing up, going to bed at night and hearing me play my music. And that was because when we moved here and we, we moved into that house in January of 2002. And I always had a room somewhere. And I liked my music loud. And so when I tucked them in, they would, you know, you can pretty well hear the music vibrating through the house no matter where you're at, uh, except for Mama's room. She will, she'll come and straighten you out. So, you know, you had to have to find that threshold where it just stopped just short of her, you know. Uh, and so when we moved into that house, and we're family is, you know, f f uh, four children, and they're getting older and needing the room, and I've got all these instruments, and there was no place at the room in the end for Greg's instruments. So, and for a while, I had them set up next to our bed. And there's mama, you know, headphones on and everything, trying to work at things at night. And that really wasn't a good situation. And uh, so finally one day, I'm in the garage and I walk out the garage and I look at that pitch coming down the garage and I go around the side and I look at the window and I know where the girl's bedroom's at there and I'm thinking, there's some space there that I don't have access to. So I go get a ladder and a sheetrock knife and <laughs> cut me a hole and poke my head up there with a flashlight. Yeah, we can make this work. <laughs> Went around and had to go into the bedroom that Kara and Katie shared. They had the largest bedroom. And I walk in there and I say, right about here, <laughs> start cutting. <laughs> Went to the store, bought a door and hung it there. That's my access. Took me probably two years to finish that room, but I built that room myself. Had to rearrange the rafters and everything to support the ceiling and all of that, and uh, got it built. I had, my, that's how desperate I was. I had a place. And so I would go in there at night after everybody's tucked in, and I would work on my music, and I'd put in the best insulation I could, but it wasn't soundproof. So the nearest room is her bedroom where she would hear at night. And I didn't know for the longest time, I figured they're asleep, and she wasn't. She was just listening to Daddy play his music. And then I thought, well, if I'm ever disturbing you, I'll turn it down. No, I like it, Daddy. It comforts me, makes me feel good, makes me feel safe. And so, you know, I just didn't ever worry about it at that point. That was one aspect of the story. The other side of that was that she was making reference to our, our church that we used to be at, which was a smaller church, and we were just, we really were like family. Um, one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life was to say goodbye to that group of people. And um, the last uh, Sunday we were together, about 75 to 100 of us just all in a circle, weeping together as they were sending me out to come here. Well, we would do that song, Miriam, and other songs. There were certain songs that had that processional feel to it that they had choreographed songs or dances to and you see the ladies get to the back and they'd gather the children up and put them in a an arrangement and they'd come down the aisle dancing 
choreographed together with that. And then other times in worship, it would just be free. The children would skip around and have banners and flags and all this stuff and just a free atmosphere of worship in there and dance. We had a dance company that was a part of that church that the, uh, the, the instructor of that dance company toured all over the world uh, dancing, uh, Christian dance company. Had those kids in classes teaching them. Uh, my daughters all took uh, interpretive dancing, you know, ballet, all of those different little genres of dance that I don't know anything about. <laughs> they, they studied all that, and they would go out and do uh, ministry, doing dance in a mall, on the street. It didn't matter. And, um, well, the story to that is, is that uh, probably about 16 or 18 years ago, a group of folks out of our church there, um, went to another church, and uh, they went to a Dennis Jernigan concert. And I couldn't go. I had to work. I was, uh, uh, doing bi- I was bivocational. Couldn't get off to go to it. And when they got to that church, they were so inspired by the children free dancing and, and the banners. And they saw that and witnessed that. It moved them. And one of the ladies was a seamstress, and she sewed. And she before Sunday, she made all these banners and flags and stuff and had them for Sunday morning and shared that to the body and we said, okay, let's try it, let's go for it. And they took off, you know, and that, that's what set that whole stage for our church to move in that area of dance and that ministry that came forth. Well, you know, I started in 01 here and it was real quickly within 01 that I was moving some stuff around the band pit and I found this waste basket full of uh, flags and banners and I began to question uh, different people in the office about wh- what those were used for. And at one time, they did that here. And the kids skipped freely, and they had the flags and the banners and what have you. And so I made a phone call at that point to find out it was here that my folks from my church came to that Dennis Jernigan concert and witnessed that, took that back to our church, birthed that there, in our church, my kids trained in dance, and then Sunday, boom, the f- comes full circle, full circle. On a course of 16, I don't know quite the year, 16 to 18 years though, that that transpired. Didn't know y'all, y'all didn't know me. <laughs> you see how awesome God is? Those are things that you just look back and you realize really the sovereignty of God and how He maps things out. Just like I told you that when I was 13 years old and I taught my parents to take me to a, a um, um, <laughs> how can his mind uh, slip my mind? Um, Andre Crouch concert. It was Andre Crouch and Reba Rambo. And, uh, and I loved Andre and I loved Reba's stuff and I got my parents to take me and and, and saw Andre Crouch in concert, and I remember this man coming out there and, and emceeing the concert, and years later, I'm here, 20 years later, and talking to uh, Curry, and Curry's telling me about that radio station that he took over and changed the format. He brought in people like Andre Crouch, and he even emceed it, and I'm like, oh, I was there. I remember. <laughs> you can't plan that kind of stuff. That's just God putting these little things and, you know, putting me in the sound of his voice as a boy of where I would be so many years later. And, and then those folks coming here and seeing that and that stirring their spirit so and, and then taking it back to our church and then 16, 18 years later, it transforms itself and it, 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 the seed comes back. <laughs> Boom! Burst forth a prophetic dance. But then there's another little part of that story because I could see as I was playing Sunday there was a young lady over here and and I just it was I couldn't I couldn't look if I had looked up I'd I never made it through the song there's no way but there was like it's like a shadow coming forth from me over here and I knew someone was dancing actually I thought all of you might have been I I didn't know And so I had to go watch the video for that. But, but I, and I didn't put this together till Monday, but the young lady came to me. I didn't know it was the same person on Sunday morning after church. And she said, you know, when I hear, when I hear a young lady talk about her father like that, I get ate up with jealousy. 
I get ate up with anger because I didn't have that. So my father left when I was four years old. I haven't seen him since. He said, but today was different. Today was a breakthrough for me. And she, she was dancing under that lead there. And I said to her, you know what? You've burst through something today because it's going to be different for your children. For your children. I mean, there was such a deep layer of things that were taking place in our body. And I want you to know how important that was. That was important. And then what the Lord began to tell me that as we had each one that came and shared, first of all, that was our body speaking. That was our body. And it was clear to me, had I touched anything, had I touched one thing, one thing, we'd have never made it to the dance. We would have not gotten where we were supposed to get to. How delicate sometimes the flow is. That if you just, you, you, you stopped it. You, you sent a different, it's like, it's like wind. And when wind comes through and it hits some obstacle, it, it sends a different trend, a different current. You didn't want to get in the way of that flow. You didn't want to send it somewhere else. Every bit of it was right. Every bit of it was right. Because every bit of it got us where we were supposed to go. That's what's important. And what we have to learn as a body, besides fear, that was one thing we kept hearing about fear. No, don't be afraid. Step out. But we've got to have a grace too. For the body. It's one of the biggest mistakes of the body of Christ. We have, we have, we, uh, you know, we have a little grace for one another sometimes. We get to this place, you know, we, we talk about grace coming into the kingdom, grace being born again. But what about grace for one another just growing up? <laughs> what about grace for one another just learning who we're supposed to be? What about grace for one another, just learning how the gifts are really supposed to operate and getting out there and trying, okay, maybe you missed it. How about that? I think we have to have grace for one another. And I, I believe we have a unique, a unique calling on us as a body um, to this community and to our, our state, to our nation. I believe that. It goes, it's bigger than we can imagine. So it, it, it drew me down to one passage today. No review of anything. The Lord said, no review. If, if y'all didn't get it, there's CDs and DVDs back there. Pick out something you missed, something you need to hear again. <laughs> but I just wanted to look at Ephesians 4, 7 through 16. I really don't know what to call this other than growing up in grace for one another. Growing up in grace for one another. We looked at this text at Wednesday night, Families on the Go. I looked at it under the context of Christ being the head, because we've been looking at spiritual authority. Christ is the head, we are the body. And I believe the church is the purest example of pure authority on the face of the earth. It's the church. Or supposed to be. <laughs> because he is the head. We are the body. He is the head. And all direction flows through the head. And the head is sending signals down to the body. And the body, if it's healthy, and responding correctly to all the signals through the nervous system that the brain is sending it, then the body should be responding it's appropriately the way it should. That the hand and the right, the left hand and the right hand are not in competition with one another. The, the arm is not being stubborn and rebellious and not allowing the signal to flow down to the fingers to do what they're supposed to do. But there's harmony, there's unity. Really, the health of the nervous system and the body of Christ has to do with unity. Unity. When there's unity, then every, all the members are working and corresponding how they're supposed to. And it doesn't even have to think about it. The head is the one thinking about it. That's kind of where 
we go with this, but there are some things I want us to look at. The thing that's really standing out in me is this thing about growing up. Growing up. And what does that look like? Ephesians 4, 7 through 16 says, But to each one of us grace was given. I highlighted that. Grace was given. Everybody say that. Grace was given. This is about grace. Amen? Be thankful. Unmerited favor. Grace. According to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, When he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. I love that. I wrote those, as, those are like three bullet points Wednesday night. We looked at each one of those. When he ascended on high, which when you look at ascended, you have to assume also he descended. And, and this scripture is about to bring that out. That he led captive a host of captives. That has to do with what he was doing when he descended. And that he gave gifts to men. He led captives free and gave gifts to men. Nine. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also had descended into lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man. A mature man. To the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about every wind of doctrine. Now look how it's defining children here. Okay, This is children, spiritual children it's speaking of. Tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ, from which the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every point, a joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. And that's a rich bunch of scriptures there. It says a lot, I think, as to how we're to be as a church. What the body of Christ is supposed to look like. You know, um, if you drive down some of these roads and you see one church after another 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 church, after another church sometimes they'll call it, well, that's church row over there. Well, really what it is, it just looks like a bunch of Christians who couldn't get along with one another. Hello! You know, I read my Bible and it was to the church of Ephesus. Uh, to the church of Corinth. You know, now we've got, I can't even keep up with just how many Baptist divisions there are. There's all kinds of divisions and we split over the most ridiculous things sometimes. Doctrine and theology. Whew. Some things that, you know, if we put a pool of people together and we tried to come to the bottom of it, you'd never get there. Because some of it's just a mystery. I'm content with that. We talked about that Wednesday night. You know, I, I have an opinion on Calvinism, five points of Calvinism. I have an opinion on election. You're not going to hear me preach it. I'm not going to do that. You know how many churches have been split over those kinds of things? Because those aren't essential things for the building up of the body of Christ. Now, I might, with a select few, that I know we can discuss these things and not uh, pull out knives and get in a fight over it. <laughs> have a discussion. But otherwise, when I get somebody that's dogmatic about me, and you can already tell they're right and I'm wrong, I'll just look at you forever and not say a word. <laughs> I was telling him, I have a gift at that. And I think it was Anthony Saucier, he said, you, you did that for a long time, right over there. <laughs> I can do that. You know, and Lord, Lord, let my phone ring. Lord. Because although even the things may be discussed, might even be true, but yet the conversation isn't profitable. Isn't profitable. I've seen church splits over... 
you know, whether we do hymns or we do contemporary Christian music, you know, even if we're going to do those songs, whether or not we're going to have drums in there. I've sung in places, but believe me, if you get in the evangelism ministry and music ministry and you go from church to church to church to church, you'll see the strangest things you've ever seen in your life. They accepted me playing the piano, but I hit that little button and the drums start playing and people start getting up and walking out because they got a demonic backbeat going on. <laughs> and what they don't even know, that whole premise is a demonic premise. It's a Pythagoras theory. It's where it comes from about certain beats causing certain things to happen. It comes from Pythagoras. It's, 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 a, it's a false teaching. It's not correct. It's just a wind of doctrine. And we, we've got to be like a ship that's it's, it's rudder is steering and the ballast is setting deep so that when the strong currents hit and the wind blows hard and you just lean back with that rope and catch it and go. You're not just driven and tossed here and there by ridiculous things. But the whole premise of the whole thing is that we might grow in the stature and the fullness of Christ. Us, apostles, teachers, evangelists, all those things. All those areas, the differing members of the body, walking in unison and walking in love. Let me tell you what, that's a, that's a rare thing on the face of this planet. It's easy to walk into a church and cause disruption. Start talking about something that gets people fired up. I've seen them split over how many raptures are going to be or whether the rapture is going to be, you know, uh, uh, before Jesus comes or is it going to be, a, you know, pre, mid, post or a pan. Pan, right? Just going to pan out somehow. <laughs> and I'm not saying you shouldn't study to understand those things, but I'm saying those are non-essential things. And when they become something that's disruptive to the body, I can tell you Jesus wants nothing to do with that. He is the head, and He doesn't want harm coming to His body. Hmm. I have a couple of points that I need to make sure that I, I get through. It's, I had a, a, a beware to the church. Beware. It takes grace to cultivate the kind of seed that I was explaining that took place in that dance. It takes grace to cultivate that. Because even when we began to experience the children dancing in the aisles and what have you, it was not perfect. We had people leave over that. I mean, and, it, and honestly, in some respects, some things they had complaints about were right. Some of these kids were running through with projectiles. You know, they could have impaled somebody. It took some management. We had to learn. We had to learn. But I think that's what I'm getting at this morning is that there must be grace. There must be grace for that season of learning and maturing and coming to full stature. And then I said, uh, I already told you, had I touched the flow, the cell would have become empty. It would have been empty. God is wanting to send us many more days of strong winds to sail by. But it will require grace. It will require humility on our part. I think the biggest challenge that we have is keeping pride in check. Because pride and opinions go hand in hand. Be careful. Everybody has an opinion of something. But it doesn't mean that what we see needs that opinion. We, what, it, what we see needs grace. It needs grace. And I had this, it says, be on constant guard against pride. I think I put that in your notes or something to that effect. Guard against pride constantly. I have to tell you a story. And I'm exposing myself. <laughs> but you need to know. Um, I did not make it to the governor's mansion this week. Oh. I was Tuesday, I was sitting at my table in my office, my wife and I counseling a young couple that were about to marry, and my phone goes off. Where are you? What? What do you mean, where am I? Are you here? What? 
I look at my phone and I see it's a 512 area code. And all of a sudden, you know how you get that feeling? You're not where you're supposed to be. <laughs> you know, the best way I can give you the example is an actor trying to, you know, to, you know <laughs> I'm just about to puke. You know, I'm just sick at my stomach because it's hit me. Something is not right. And here I've been counseling for probably an hour and 20 minutes, and, all, and I'm, 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 I'm just on top of my game, and all of a sudden, I, I'm just shut down. And I start, I've got I to gotta, I gotta answer this, I'm sorry. And I began to text and realize that I don't know how I had it in my head, but I know I came out of the office off that phone call saying Thursday. Wrote it down Thursday. But it was Tuesday. Which is a good thing because my students were still in the cleaners. They weren't ready for Tuesday. <laughs> and um, I'm just, you know, thinking, wow, I cannot believe this. And then it began to kind of slip in my spirit. You know, Greg, you were pretty prideful with that opportunity. Uh, yeah, I know. I was. Because honestly, y'all weren't even the, you, Nobody was there when I got the phone call from him initially. And we'll just pretend that's the phone. And. You know, my buddy Wayne calls me, and he's asking me, and he said, are you op available that day? And I'm like, oh, let me check. <laughs> and look at my calendar. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that, uh, I think I couldn't do that Thursday. I'm not exaggerating. I'm not just telling a story. That is exactly what I did. And then walking out and telling uh, Linda, Thursday, I'm going to be in the governor's mansion having lunch with the governor. <laughs> you know. Told all of you. And I'm just sitting there, oh my goodness. How did I do that? And 20 minutes later, a little prophetess comes into my office. And she has a few things to share with me. And particularly three things from Sunday service. One had to do with the new government that uh, spoken through uh, uh, Rufus. Another one was when Rufus was talking about the receding waters and the mountains. She said, I saw seven mountains. And in these seven mountains, there were seven areas of anointing that God is anointing you with. And I couldn't, I didn't bring it with me to, to tell you, but the first one was government. And that there would be an apostolic voice to government. In which, honestly, I do have some weird relationships that, you know, how did I have these relationships with that guy to even think to call me to put me in the governor's mansion? And, I mean, I have a buddy that was the right-hand man of, of um, Mike Huckabee. Um, when Mike Huckabee was running for president, nobody knew who he was. And they came to Houston. Guess who picked him up at the airport? I did. You know, and just a strange deal. I thought, well, if he gets elected to president, I was going to have embroidery on my seat. You know, <laughs> Mike Huckabee sat here. Yeah. Of course, I've done some music production since then that he hasn't, he hasn't aired for me. So I thought, boy, if I'd have had that seat, it'd already be out by now. You know, it, <laughs> but anyhow, I'm teasing on that. But, but just unique, you know, things like that. And, uh, and as she was sharing with me all of those areas, then she said, but you must guard yourself of pride. You must guard yourself of pride. And I just kind of leaned back and looked at her and said, well, you kind of already taught me that one today. <laughs> and I shared with her what happened. And she grabbed my arm and she said, Greg, it has nothing to do with the event. It's an anointing. There will be many more opportunities. It's an anointing. And I said, I received that. And I knew what I had to do. I wrote the most humblest letter that I could think of to send to not only my friend Wayne, I, even though I addressed it to him, my main purpose was to send it to his contacts because they were a part of uh, Rick Perry's uh, organization. And I wanted them to know that I apologize for any embarrassment or inconvenience that I might have caused by my not showing up on behalf of Wayne for bringing that opportunity. And I mean, I sent it out. They quickly responded very graciously and don't worry about that. It happens. And, and Wayne responded the next morning. He's a very humorous guy, such as myself. And his response in bold caps was, 
don't jump. It's okay. <laughs> You're on the list. There'll be more opportunities. Love your friend Wang. <laughs> and that is true. And it just confirmed. And I thought in my spirit, there will be a greater opportunity that comes as a result of that. But I did need to learn that lesson. I needed to learn that lesson. But I think we as a church, I tell you that story because we all need to learn that lesson. Why would I want to stand before God as merciful and gracious as He is and think that I would stand for any kind of division against the body of Christ? In any form. And I'm not speaking of any undercurrent going on out here. I'm just telling what God gave me, okay? Don't read anything into what I'm saying. I'm just, this word is for where we're going. This is something that you have to be on protection about. I've been through church splits and all that mess. I've seen the nasty over a ton of different reasons. It would just make you shake your head in unbelief. But the truth is, any church is susceptible to it if they do not cover one another with grace. And see, when I get words or images about demonic things coming about our church, I care less about that. Because I know he was defeated at Calvary. He's a little toothless liar. He likes to lie. He likes to deceive. He likes to get your perception different from that person's perception so that you perceive differently. And then you read into one another what each other does so that you are in division without any truth. <laughs> that's what he does that's how he works that's why Ephesians says that there, it's fiery darts schemes of the devil fiery darts and that's why you have a shield of faith I don't have to worry about that I don't have to worry about that division never starts from that division starts in the camp from this that's when we, we shared that Wednesday night. It was a revelation to me. Never really looked at it. It's simple, but the mouth is not on the body. The mouth is on the head. <laughs> he is the one in control of what's spoken. James says no man can tame the tongue. We are not capable, but he is. We are the body. We are the members. We are the ones that need to comply with what the head is trying to do. That's why Diablo is what? Accuser of the brethren. And all of the things the churches think they have split over, all of the conflicts that churches think they have gone through, they never saw it coming. It all began with that right there and what proceeded out of it. And they become the mouthpiece of the enemy speaking accusation against one another. You don't want to do that. You, you need to remember that next time you have a thought to speak that against a brother or sister in the Lord. Wow, I do not want to be Satan's mouthpiece. I don't want to be his trumpet. That is the greatest destructive tool against the church. You can narrow it down to that every time. It's not five-point Calvinism. It's not tongues. It's not praise and worship. It is this. This originates from this every time. And that was the word that the Lord was stirring in my heart. That as we see things begin to flow or open up and maybe even make mistakes. You know, I'll make mistakes. I've practiced in my head. What I do with the person that gets out of line, I decided I'm going to run and give them a bear hug. <laughs> and then... Try to wrestle the microphone away while I'm bear hugging them. <laughs> and try to gently and love lead them back to their seat, you know. 
And you pray that doesn't happen, but it very well may. Very well may. But we must have grace for one another. We must have grace for one another. The full stature of the fullness of Christ is a man who knows the direct command of God and obeys. Yet even knows the very ideas of God that we are generated by His will and only communicated by our unity in Christ. Our deepness and our stature of the fullness of Christ is being one with the Father. Our ability to grow in stature, our ability to, to walk in the deep things of God comes out of unity. It comes out of unity with the Father. It's what Jesus did. I am, he said He's one with the Father. And we're one with the Father because we're one with Him. There's oneness. It's unity. I had written down here, uh, pay attention to the wind. Lord, make us wind watchers. Every day won't be like last one. Today will be different than last one. The wind blows differently every day. But be wind watchers. Then my second point on grace was grace. Grace is the soil that makes gifts flourish. Grace is the soil that makes gifts flourish. It says that the body has been gifted in that text. The body has been gifted. It has its diversity with many members by the fact that Jesus ascended to the Father. And in His ascension... This giftings was, re was released. Then it says that Jesus ascended also implies that he descended. Jesus was not laying in some altered states of consciousness in the tomb. You know, he wasn't asleep in the tomb. He was a busy man. A busy man. Going down and releasing the captives. Preaching deliverance to the captives. Taking the keys of hell and of death. And then leading those captives free. And then in that process of leading those captives free, he released a diversity to the body. That some are apostles, and some are prophets, and some evangelists, and some are pastors, and some are teachers. And, and in this process of this release, all these grace giftings are on the body of Christ that we're to grow. That we're to grow into the fullness, this full stature. He fills all things. He equips the body of Christ for kingdom work and for the building up of the body. The outcome of this ascension and this release is what we have experienced. We, th we experience it through unity and growth to maturity to the full stature of Christ. And this is the picture that I cannot get out of my mind. That full stature of Christ. The best example is looking at your kids. How quickly do they grow up? Amen? And, and especially as I, I look at Gregory, who's uh, just turned 13. And for the longest, yeah, can you believe that? Just turned 13. He was two years old when we moved into that house. And when we moved into that house, one of the first things we did was I went to the bathroom in the master bedroom. And I think I shared with this at men's prayer because they could relate to this. But, you know, the nest is my wife's. So I understand that. She's not going to let me put my art on the wall. It's her art on the wall, Right? I did good to go into the bathroom, that little room where the commode is at, you know. I had my John Wayne paraphernalia put all over the wall. I even had a full-size silhouette of John Wayne. That when you open up the door, you couldn't see him. When you close the door, <gasps> there, there he is. First time Curry Juno came over to our house and he went back there, I heard him scream back there. Say, so, oh, he just met John. <laughs> that was my place until I built my room that I was telling you about and then mama made everything move up there I can put whatever I want to in there and now I lost even that little area except for one thing when you walk through the little door there on that door frame when Gregory was two years old we put him up against the door frame and we marked his height and we dated it and then every so often, he'd be like, Daddy, measure me again. Measure me again. He wants to see how he's growing in stature. Yeah. So we'd measure him again. And we'd measure him again. And we'd measure him again and date them. So you could go. You could, it's the history of the growth of my son. 
I can see it on the, on the frame, marking his growth. And now he's 13 and he, he still wants to be measured. Daddy, measure me now. So he wants to look at that and then look down there and then, wow, look how I've grown. Growing into this full stature of Christ is what God's looking at us for. I, I, I look at him, he used to like a little boy, now his, his shoulders are getting broad and you're starting, he's starting to like a little man. I, I'll just look at him from the side of the head, just stare at him sometimes, because what am I looking at? I'm seeing the stature of a man coming out of this little boy. And that's what the church is about. We're to be growing in stature so when our Heavenly Father looks down, He begins to see. He's looking at the back of our head and He says, Wow! The church is growing to full stature. She's growing up. That's what it's about. And we must do everything that we can to protect that. That's what we fight for. If you want to fight over something, fight over protecting that. Watchman Nee said, uh, there are, he, he differentiated, I've been reading some Watchman Nee books, and he differentiated between commands and God's will in a very unique way. And I loved it because it made sense to me. But you have his commands, right? They're plain as day. <laughs> Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not stick beans up your nose. <laughs> right? You should know not to do that. Those are things you really should not have to be told. Those are direct commands. I remember, uh, it's what, in junior high and high school, sight reading band, that, that, there's this fundamental things in music, certain principles of music you should not have to be told over and over and over again. And the band director would get mad and hit the stand with his baton. I told you, don't stick beans up your nose. Shouldn't have to tell you that. There's just certain commands of God that we just shouldn't have to be told. Those are commands. We, we understand those. But the will of God is, doesn't have to be uttered. The will of God is something within His Spirit, in unity with His Spirit. He impresses us. He tells us things through communion with Him. We have this impression. We discern things. We move in His will as He's leading us. You don't even have to hear it. You don't have to be told. You can just feel it. Sunday was one of those kind of days. You know, you, before the service even started, I couldn't talk without weeping because you could feel such a presence in the room. And sometimes the Lord moves upon you with His will, speaking things to your heart. It doesn't have to be a, a word. It's just through unity. It's through relationship with Him that He speaks. That's the level on which the church should be operating. So that's the level that the disciples couldn't get to. They were so busy in what they had read and what the prophets had said and saying that Jesus is coming to rule and reign and yet in Jesus' innermost man, in His relationship with His Father, His Father had a different will that He was speaking to Him. We, the disciples hadn't heard it uttered. They hadn't heard it spoken until Jesus finally says, I'm going to have to be crucified. I'm going to have to be buried. And then I'm going to resurrect after three days. He was responding to the will of God that was stirred in him. This mission that was in him through communion with his father, what his father had sent him to do. Those things you find through unity with him. And as a church, the will of God, we respond to that through unity as the body of Christ. Through unity. Unity. I want to just read a couple of points here. The full stature of Christ. The full stature of Christ is, isn't even gifts. It's not gifts. He said some are this, some are that. The giftings help us get there. We need apostles. We need teachers. But the fullness comes through Christ's character in our lives. That's where the fullness comes. And the purpose of you being who you are is to build up one another in the body, to grow, to mature to the fullness, the fullness of the character of Christ, the full stature, mature in the things of the Spirit, not just the power, not just the power. You can have power 
and not have character. See it all the time. <laughs> if you ask him for power, you very well may get it. But power without character is a train wreck. Samson had power, but lacked character. And all he could produce was destruction. <laughs> he still did, God still used him. But in the end, it even destroyed him. Must have character. You don't hear people pray for that very much. Lord, I pray you just give me a gift of Christ-like character. <laughs> you know, and you must be careful with that. I remember uh, memorizing James 1 and having a spirit of pride on me. Count it therefore, brethren, with joy when you fall into various temptations and knowing that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And I had that whole thing memorized and I'm quoting it to people, wanting them to see how spiritual I am, that I got all this memorized. And I was out on a golf course playing golf with a pastor and a worship pastor and quoting that verse. And I'm on about the fifth hole, and I can hear the pastor's wife coming closer on a golf cart. Greg, Greg, everything's okay, but your wife's been in a wreck. And went through a, a major old ordeal of a, 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 a TDC official who was drunk as a skunk at 11 a.m., drank a fifth of scotch and chased it down with Coors beers. All of the stuff is right there on the floorboard. Slammed into my wife at uh, 11 a.m., and uh, even though she had her seatbelt on, she, she, my, my wife drives kind of like an elderly lady, you know. <laughs> and that little Mustang, she still found the windshield. She has beauty scars from, from that incident. I mean, her hair was in the windshield. It was just it was an awful thing. And then, then to go to the emergency room and find my wife laying there, you know, bleeding and, and helpless, and I'm wanting to do something, and who did this? And, and, and you're talking about strange order of events. That fella didn't even lose his job. And he was in charge of early release program for people getting out on parole. And when my wife finished college and started her job, um, I gave my resignation so I could go to school full time. Guess who I had to work with my very last day on the job? And is that not God to try and teach you something? Those are not lessons you really want to learn. I had to put a name, I had to put a towel over my lame, name tag so he wouldn't see who I was because I, I thought I had gotten over it. And then I'm thinking the whole time, boy, I could just beat the mess out of him right now. What are they going to do to me? It was my last day. <laughs> and when I explained to him why I did it, even the police ain't going to be too bothered about it. I was really thinking that way. That's what I was processing. And I realized, wow, I ain't got over it. You know, the character of Christ is a deeper thing. A deeper thing that makes the power more effective. And that's where I want to go. Amen? That's where I want to go. I want to go where... You know, if we're going to be competitive about things, let's be competitive about feeding the hungry. <laughs> I fed more than you did. Praise God. You know. I, I want to be uh, competitive about visiting the sick. Saw more of them this week than you did. Praise God. I mean, those are something to get competitive about. I pray you outdo me. Get with it. Do that. Let me make sure I didn't miss anything. I said, interesting enough, the mouth is not a part of the body. The mouth is a part of the head. We must speak as the oracles of God and not out of foolish flesh. That is a misuse of what authority is designed to sound forth from the mouth. I believe Sunday the oracles of God were coming forth from the body of Christ. The words were as the oracles of Christ. Jesus, the head, was speaking. I believe that. And the result of our full stature is that we no longer act like immature children. That's what the full stature is. We no longer act like immature children. 
We no longer behave like a ship with no ballast, unstable on the water that cannot ground itself or pull against the current or utilize the wind instead of being scattered by it. We no longer fall for foolish doctrines and untruths that scatter people into confusion and stupid vain discussions. And yes, I wrote stupid in my notes. That result in nothing but fear and confusion. We have discernment in the body to know when predators are near and have evil intentions. But even in their exposure, we respond to them with grace and love, but we refuse to let them execute their schemes but rather expose them and correct them in love. That was a revelation to me. When you see Jesus in Scripture interacting with Judas Iscariot, not one point do you find him rail him or speak evil of him. Matter of fact, what you see in Scripture is that Jesus gave Judas Iscariot every opportunity to walk in the fullness just as he did every other disciple. When he took those 12, he sent all 12 of them out. With all power and all authority. He said, well, wait a minute. Jesus, Judas has got a little bit of funny character there. Let's limit him. <laughs> no, he didn't do that. In the end, he gave him every opportunity. And every opportunity. And the, in the end, it was Judas who hung himself. He hung himself. Jesus did not. Jesus showered him with acceptance. Jesus showered him with opportunity. He didn't treat them differently. The end effect is that we find ourselves a part of a healthy, fit body. And the fitness will, uh, was simply made available by the head resting upon the shoulders of the body. With grace and with love. And the body listens to the ideas and the wills of God. That's what the will is of the Father. The will of the Father is it's, it's His idea. It's His thinking. This is how the Father thinks about this thing. And if you're tapped into His Spirit and He's bestowing His will upon you, now you, you're into what He's thinking about something. You're into what he, His ideas are about this. What He expects out of this thing. I was a TDC guard for about three years or so. I spent a lot of time working in ad seg. If anybody knows, it's administrative segregation. It's jail within jail. It's those who can't comply with things in the general population, so they're kicked off into another jail, isolated. And I can tell you, when you go into environments like that, you can feel murder. You'll feel it. You can feel hatred. It'll be so thick. Be like butter. I feel like you could just take a knife and carve it out. You can feel it. At the same time, I had left that prison work and started at my first church, and they got into such a division. Did you know that on Sunday mornings, I could feel the very same spirit in that building that I felt at Adseg? Same one. I was familiar with what that felt like. And I could feel it. And it was just good people. And I thought, my goodness. How the church needs to guard itself. Guard itself. Guard unity. Fight for her protection. Unity is equivalent to health. Unity is equivalent to the health to our nervous system. When our nervous system is healthy, all pistons are firing as they should. Amen? Signals are coming forth from the head and going where they're supposed to go. And the body is responding correctly. That's a healthy body. Amen? I want you to stand. May seem like a strange word, but I couldn't get away from it. All week long, I tried on your behalf <laughs> and mine. But it says, Psalms 45, 2, You were fairer than the sons of men. Grace poured upon your lips. Let grace pour upon our lips. Lord, let our minds...
concentrate on grace. Let our actions concentrate on grace. Lord, that all that we do flows out of grace, just as you did. How gracious you are with us. How gracious you are, Father, to us. How you love us. Lord, your mercy and your grace, your loving kindness, it endures forever. And Lord, I have not gotten things that I deserved. You've had mercy upon me. And Lord, the grace that you've bestowed upon me of things that I didn't earn, don't deserve, but your grace, without even earning it, with unmerited, having in my own flesh seeming no right to it, but because of Jesus and what Jesus has done upon the cross, you've given us access. Your word says, therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. It's grace. It's grace. It's beyond what our fleshly mind can comprehend or how we would respond to things or think of things. We need to get past that and see things according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh so that we discern things correctly out of the eyes of grace, Lord God. And I pray, Father, that we'll see in many days to come outpourings of things. And Lord, when we see people stepping out, and Lord, they're stepping out in boldness of things that you've birthed into their heart. Words of knowledge or even prophecy. We want to see outpourings of those things. Lord, praying for the sick and stepping out in boldness on things. Lord, that even when we seem to have made a mistake, that we'll not point a finger. We'll just say, praise God. Thank you for, for stepping out with boldness. And, and very likely what could be is that maybe we just didn't see the outpouring of that then it might take it 16 or 18 years to come full circle. Just like that dance today. That dance took 16 to 18 years. And I can tell you, I know that it, at times, it, there were times where the body would think, why are we doing this? And why are we allowing this? And why this is not good? And I know we went through that at our church. We're like, why are we doing this? And this is so chaotic. And this is out of order. Or this is out of line. And... And then the truth is there's such a release, such a, 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 a cycle of, of growth that comes out of that. That sometimes 16 or 18 years before it rears its head. In terms, it seems so long to us, but to you, it's but a vapor. It's nothing. You are so incredible, God, at how you orchestrate things in our lives. That, Lord, if we can just walk in a spirit of grace... Trusting, Lord God, that you are in charge and in control. And what all we want to do is grow in the full stature of Christ. That we'll walk maturely so that we're not driven and tossed by winds of doctrine. That we're not tossed around by strife or foolish things, Lord God. But that we understand what your heart is. And your heart is for the body of Christ. To grow. To mature in full stature. And I pray, Father, in the days to come and in the weeks to come and the months to come, and I know that the things we've experienced in the last 21 days of fasting, that we're still going to see things coming forth from that. Even as it approached, the, Lord, if you don't come between now and January and we, we, we say that we do this again, Lord God, we know we're still going to see things unfolding from the first one. And that there will be a fireball that just grows and rolls. And, and Lord, it's a consuming fire of deep things of your spirit that you're wanting to move us in. But I pray, Father, we would be a hound dog in sniffing out things that would cause harm to the body. That we would be diligent and on our toes to protect, to cover one another. To bathe one another in prayer and to, to, to look out for one another. I pray that. To not expose one another, but yet walk in restoration with one another in things. Love, grace, mercy, all of these things of your spirit. That we just see them flourish to a level that, Lord, that just as in Jesus' day, that the, they would say, they'll know you're my disciples by your love. We'll see love that's not measurable. It's mind-blowing. And people will just be compelled to come off of that highway, drawn in by spirit, and park their car and walk in and say, I want to be saved. 
there'd be that kind of a power oozing out of this place that comes from a unity of your spirit. The people would just be compelled to not be able to pass it up, but turn in. Seeking deliverance, seeking salvation, seeking healing, Father God. Even those that are starting to watch streaming, Father. We've had people that are streaming from all over. Even all over the world. It's a small number, but it's going to grow. People are watching. And then even in that, that you'll release things out of that. I pray. Take us to a deeper place. Lord, thank you in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. <laughs> Good.